Well, we're going to commence our service this evening by singing the hymn, God Sent His Son, They Called Him Jesus, and that wonderful chorus, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Let's start off with the opening hymn, and we'll stand to sing. sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, Emmanuel healed, he lived and died, to find life more than an empty grave, to prove and hundreds of hymns and gospel songs. That's probably the best known of all of them. It was written back in the 1960s. Some of us can remember that. Others can't. But it was written at a time when the pair of them were experiencing some difficulty. Um, he was ill at the time. She was expecting another child, their third child. And they we're looking at the world around them, and they were saying it's a crazy world. It was a time when there was social and political trouble in America, racial tensions, drug abuse. The educational system was deteriorating rapidly in America. There were all sorts of things that troubled them. And she thought about the fact they were bringing another child into a world just like that. And as she was thinking about it on New Year's Eve, she was thinking about all these things and suddenly there came over her a sense of calm and assurance. And she felt at peace with the world because she felt it was right just to leave it all 
in the hands of God. The world may be in chaos, but he lives, he reigns, he rules. Shortly after that, they wrote the song, he wrote the tune, she wrote the words, and the verse that inspired it in many ways was John 14 and 19, because I live, ye shall live also. There are many parallels between the 60s and the present day. Many, many parallels, socially, morally, religiously, all sorts of parallels. And it's a great thought indeed for us in this day and in our age. Because he lives, we have no need to fear. Let's pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence tonight in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thine only begotten Son. We thank thee afresh tonight for that redeeming work of Christ at Calvary. We thank thee that there he bore our penalty, he took our place, he died for us. And we thank thee that through him we can experience new life, fullness of life, abundant life in Jesus Christ. We thank thee for all the privileges that are bestowed upon us when we enter into that relationship with thee, born again of the Spirit of God and adopted into the family of God. We thank thee, our Father, that we come to one such as thyself, who is unchanging and unchanged in a world of chaos and uncertainty. We thank thee that whilst other things come and go, while the world is constantly changing, we have one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Father, we come to thee this evening and we ask thy blessing upon our time of worship we pray, Lord, that thou wouldst take out of our minds all the other things that might distract us and help us to fix, to focus our hearts upon thee. That we'll come to thee in a true sense of worship. That we'll come to thee seeking to hear thy voice speaking through thy word. And that, Lord, at the end, we'll be not only hearers but doers of thy word. We pray, Lord, for those who are here tonight who are perhaps not feeling too well or perhaps grieving tonight over some family situation. Father, we pray that thou wouldst minister to the needs of each and every one here tonight. Thou knowest the personal spiritual needs of everyone here tonight. And again, we ask, O oh Lord, that thou would speak to us and touch our hearts through thy word. And we think of those who are unable to be here because of illness, we ask, Lord, that thou wouldst touch them. We think also of those who are away on holiday and pray that as they have some time away that they'll return refreshed and renewed and strengthened for the work of the year ahead. We ask thy blessing too, Lord, upon similar gatherings up and down the land tonight and elsewhere, wherever thy word is faithfully preached. We ask, Lord, that there'll be a response to that word and that hearts and lives will be changed and touched, and that there'll be men and women and young folk who'll come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Pray, Lord, thy blessing upon all those who are engaged, especially from this church, in, in uh, evangelistic work over the summer period. Think of those who are in full-time work, whether in um, Grantham or across the border in the Republic or with Asia Link. We ask thy blessing upon them. Think of those who take a few weeks over the summer to help with open air, beach missions, children's work, all the different things. Oh Lord, we pray that in holiday resorts, in housing estates, wherever the message of the gospel goes forth, that thou wouldst bless it to thine honor and glory. Help us tonight, Lord, as we continue with thee. Bless us as we sing thy praise. For we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight is from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 
Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll read from verse 11 through to the end of the chapter. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it does not enforce as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. But when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the holy things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For God has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but unto heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. I'm going to ask Sam if he would bring the announcements to us at this point in the service. Good evening, folks. Yes, you're awake. Good. Um, Nelson has already welcomed you, and I, I'll add my own to that. It's good to see you, and thank you for joining with us. Uh, whether you're here in the building or, or online, uh, thank you um, for being part of our service this evening. Um, Nelson offered to lead, and I didn't disagree with him at all, um, and I'm very grateful um, for him doing that, and uh, also for opening God's Word in, in a few moments. Um, next Sunday, uh, you'll, you'll see from the bulletin, this is still fairly accurate. I don't think there's too much has changed. But you'll see from that that next Sunday morning at 11.30, Andrew Quinn will be speaking. And then at 8.30 in the evening, Donald Coulter. And uh, Donald, obviously, uh, well known to most of us here. Other announcements are few and far between. Uh, just with a condensed program over the summer, there are no midweek meetings but they will recommence in August uh, with the Deacons uh, looking after those. 
mentioned um, Holiday Bible Club in August. The dates are on the bulletin as well. Um, Julie does need help for that and, and in order for that to run. So if that's something that you are able to help with, um, and uh, there'll be a, a range of things that will need to be done uh, during that. So have a chat with Julie. And as I said this morning, volunteers are always better than conscripts. Um, so go and, go and chat to Julie if you can help her at all. Uh, folks who are away, um, Robbie is away over the, the whole of the summer, uh, just with that camp work in Canada. Please continue to remember him. And then this week, if you look in the bulletin, you'll see uh, that Hazel and Brian and Nathaniel uh, are involved in uh, faith mission camp in the camp center there in Portadown. Um, please remember that work um, and uh, just that they will have a good time and opportunity to share the gospel with the folks who are coming along to the camp. And then finally, just as I mentioned this morning, uh, if you have any gardening equipment that you could uh, pass on to Spark uh, that's of, of a decent quality um, and that they, they'd be able to work with and use, um, if there's any of that lying around the, the, the garage or the shed, then uh, I think Daniel would be pleased uh, to hear that and to take that off your hands. And uh, you, can, you can have a chat with them about what they need for that. I think that's everything. And uh, I'll hand back to Nelson. Thank you. Well, we'll join together now in our second hymn of praise tonight, um, and that's the hymn, How Great the Chasm That Lay Between Us, How High the Mountain I Could Not Climb, and the chorus then about living hope.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again tonight for the Holy Scripture. Thy word is truth. It is the true word of the one who is true. And Father, we thank thee that it is thine own inspired word that is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. The man and woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We thank thee that thy word is able to show us the way of salvation. Thy word is able to convict of sin. And we pray that through thy word, thou wouldst touch our hearts, each and every one here tonight. We need thy help. We seek thy help. We trust in thee. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was thinking about this evening's service, I was drawn to some verses from the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Now, the first time I ever spoke on these verses was, I think, 48 years ago. So hopefully it's a bit better than it was 48 years ago. But it's a passage that has stuck in my mind and I've gone back to again and again many times. Warren Wearsby, in his little commentary, said that it's the three tenses of salvation, past, present, and future. The three appearings of Christ, past, present, future. I want to just look at them tonight with you and see what the Lord would say to us through them. And we start there in verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. It's a reminder, first of all, of where Jesus has gone. Tells us there that he has gone into heaven, into the presence of God. We thank the God tonight that our Savior is one who rose bodily from the grave and ascended bodily into heaven. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The Lord Jesus was standing there with them, and then they were able to watch as he bodily ascended into heaven. We know where Jesus has gone, but the question we might well ask is, what Jesus is doing? What is he doing? Well, it tells us there, now to appear in the presence of God for us. 
cross. What's he doing in the presence of God for us? I remember many years ago going down one Sunday afternoon to Carrick Fergus in the car. I took Mary out in the car and we went down to Carrick Fergus for a run to see uh, what was on there and there was an open air. You can tell I'm the last of the big spenders when I took her out, I took her to an open air meeting. And there you are. We went down to the open air and there were people outside the castle who were standing around holding an open air and they were singing. And it was the first time I'd ever heard the particular hymn. And the hymn was, I have a Savior. He's pleading in glory. A dear loving Savior, the worth friends be few. And now he is watching in tenderness o'er me. And oh, that my Savior were your Savior too. They weren't the greatest singers, but it was a wonderful message. And that hymn stuck in my mind that day and ever since. I have a Savior. What's he doing? He's pleading in glory. Charles Wesley described that work beautifully in one of his hymns. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all-redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood atoned for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him. Oh, forgive, they cry, nor let that ransomed sinner die. The wounds of Jesus were taken into glory. And there the blood of Christ speaks and says, Forgive him, oh forgive, nor let that ransomed sinner die. It's so much better than what we find in the Old Testament. In fact, the book of Hebrews, the word that runs through it is that word better. It's a word that runs through the book of Hebrews. Because in the Old Testament, you had repeated sacrifices again and again and again. New Testament, one was sufficient for all. One sacrifice. No need for repetition. No need for reenactment. Sufficient. And there in the Old Testament, it was the blood of animals that was slain, that was offered. Here, in the New Testament, it's his own blood that shed. In the Old Testament, sacrifice was offered for an individual, for a family, and then for a nation, for the nation of Israel. But in the New Testament, he's the Lamb of God, taketh away the sin of the world. How much better. No need for repetition, one sacrifice. Not the blood of animals, but the blood of the only begotten Son of God. And a sacrifice that was not for a particular nation, but was international in its reach. Warren Wearsby said, we're not depending on a high priest on earth who annually visits the Holy of Holies in a temporary sanctuary. We depend on the heavenly high priest who has entered once and for all into the eternal sanctuary. He's pleading for us in glory. And in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, it tells us that he is seated there. He sat down, it says, at the right hand of the throne of God, or seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When someone sits down, their work is done. Those people who'll be going out with spark, with all of the shovels and spades and rakes and all the rest, after they've worked all day at that, they'll be glad to sit down. 
you worked, the work is done. That's what the seating signifies. He's seated at the right hand of God in glory. The work is done. It is sufficient. And so what's he doing for us now? He's interceding for us, appearing in the presence of God for us. There's something of that thought in that opening hymn. Because he lives, we have a living Savior who lives for us in glory, who's pleading for us, and who's with us, whatever the world may throw at us. There's a present appearing there in those first two verses. And then we move on to the next part, to the middle of verse 26. Now once, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. The word that's used there for appear is different from the first one. The three words are different. And the word that's used there has that sense of revealing one's true character. In a sense, at one point this morning, Andrew touched on that when he spoke about the Lord Jesus here on earth as a revelation of the nature of God. And there's so much of that revelation of the character of God in the work that was done in the past. It tells us here about that work, the work of Calvary. And it tells us there that the work of Calvary was complete. In 1 Peter 3 and 18, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That's why Jesus said, it's finished. It's paid in full. There can be no repetition. There are those who believe that here on earth a priest can offer a sacrifice that is a repetition of Calvary. How foolish. How contrary to Scripture, because it is paid in full. There was a teenage boy at one time who was a little bored in the house. His mother was out, and he was looking for something to do, and he wandered into, I suppose, the library where they kept some books in the house. The little boy went in, and he just took a book down off the shelf and started to read it. And it was a Christian book. His parents were Christians. And as he picked it up and started to read through it, he came upon a little phrase. The phrase was, the finished work. The finished work. But that's a funny phrase to use. It's an odd phrase. If it had spoken about the saving work, possibly, the redeeming work could be many things. Why did they call it the finished work? And it stuck in his mind, and he began to think about that phrase. And as he thought about it, it suddenly dawned on him in a way that often happens. You can be familiar with something, and you read it again and again and again, and then suddenly the light dawns. He said to himself, if it's finished, that means there's nothing left for me to do. And suddenly, the simplicity of the gospel dawned upon him. There was nothing left for him to do because it had all been done at Calvary. And Jesus said, it is finished. That little boy was J. Hudson Taylor who went on to found the um, China Inland Mission. And those words of his, if the whole work was finished and the whole debt was paid, what is there left for me to do? It's not what I do. It's what he has done. The work of Calvary was 
complete. It was once for all. The cross was the outworking in history of the redemptive purposes of God. The old Puritan Thomas Watson put it so beautifully when he said, he who crowned the heavens with stars was himself crowned with thorns. Mm. Oh, what a wonderful love, unexampled love, all, all redeeming grace. As we think of how Jesus did that for sinners such as we. He died on that cross a violent death. He died on that cross a voluntary death. He died in our place. And he died victoriously. It's not only a complete work there at Calvary in the past. It's a comprehensive work. The Lord hath laid on him, Isaiah 53, verse 6. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why, whether it's that we go to meet people here in our own land, in our own city, in our own community, in our own family, or whether it be that it be in a distant land, in a foreign country, or whatever, we can say the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And if it says all, it includes you. That's why we can go with the message of the gospel and offer it to others, young and old, male, female, rich, poor, it matters not. The work of Calvary was comprehensive. And doesn't it reveal to us so clearly the character of God? Redeeming love. Love that's beyond our highest comprehension. Paul says we can't know the length of it. We can't know the breadth of it. We can't know the height of it. We can't know the depth of it. Those depths that Jesus came down to for us. He left the heights of heaven and came down to be abused and rejected and despised of men. For those who were his enemies. For those who were in rebellion against him. Unexampled love. None other like it. That's our God. Then why do we trouble ourselves with so many things? He's a sovereign God. He's a loving God. We can trust him whatever may befall. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life. And then, as it is appointed once unto men to die, after this, the judgment. Now, that little sentence there at the start of verse 27 is a reminder of the importance of that truth. It's not just a doctrine to be believed and accepted and noted, it's of supreme importance because it is appointed unto men once to die. There are many things in life that are uncertain. There are appointments that people make and break. But there's one appointment that no one breaks. It is appointed unto men once to die. You can break a doctor's appointment. You can forget the dentist's appointment. You can forget all sorts of appointments. You might miss them. That's one appointment that we can't break. That's why preparation for eternity is so important. And that's why that great historic work of Christ at Calvary is so important. Because only through him can we be ready for that appointment. Once to die. And after this, the judgment. And then thirdly, the future appointment. If there's a present um, tense that we looked at there, that present tense there of the 
present appearing of Christ in majesty, a past appearing in history, there's a future appearing as well. And we meet that in the last part of verse 28, the future appearing in glory. The word that's used there again for appearing is a different word. This past week, I went to the opticians to get new glasses. And the word optician, the word optical, all those are words that are connected with our eyes and with seeing. The word that's used there in the original for appearing comes from the same word in the original, the word I. And it's a sense of a visible appearing, the visibility of that future appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be visible. Just as they watched him and saw him ascending up into heaven, so that we will see him descending from heaven. I want to say to you tonight, that's a biblical truth. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Now, it's a truth that runs right through the Bible from beginning to end. You find it in the Old Testament, but you also find it particularly in the New Testament. And it is one of the fundamentals of the faith. We find it in the Gospels. We find it in the writings of Paul. And we find it also in the final book of the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. If you look in chapter 1 and verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. He cometh with clouds, just as he ascended into the clouds. And just as every eye saw him ascending, so every eye shall see him descending. Promised by Jesus, preached by the apostles, portrayed in the book of Revelation. And yet, sadly, there are some today who would say, it's just not true. If you look in 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation scoffers in the last days, where is it? There are those today, and just as there have been for many years, people who would deny that truth, that the Lord Jesus is indeed coming again bodily and visibly. I was just looking there, it's 1963. It's one of the books that I came across in the, in the late 60s. And the old Bishop of Woolwich at that time, John Robinson, he said, the second coming is not something that can be seen. The Bible is not describing a literal event that is only going to happen once in the remote or near future. Even now, he said, he insists on coming in. Maybe it wasn't the man you traveled up with the other morning in the train. Wow. I'm looking forward to something far better than somebody I sat beside on the bus. I'm looking forward to the fact that the Lord Jesus will descend from heaven bodily, visibly, gloriously. He will come in like manner. But certainly in that last half century, there have been many in our churches who have denied that truth of the reality, the physicality, the visibility of the second coming of Christ. William Barclay said, we have to abandon the literal and physical idea of the second coming. 
those who are scoffers who would say in the last days, that's not how it's going to be. But you know, the Bible teaches us something very different. There are some who deny it, and we've given you examples of that. Some who get distorted views of the second coming and get caught up in all sorts of strange ideas. And that's possible. I think of all the people I've come across down through the years who have had strange ideas about when and how the second coming would be. They get caught up in it. Strange ideas about how it will be fulfilled. And people can become fanatical about it and quite controversial with their views. But they're losing sight of the core fact. It's not so much how it will happen. It's the fact of who is coming. It's about a person. Just as the Christian life is about a relationship with a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming is about the arrival of a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is indeed a biblical truth, one of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. It's a biblical truth. But it's also a blessed and beautiful hope. In Titus 2 and 13, the writer says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I was struck when I was reading it again this past week by one word. It's the word eagerly. You find it in some translations of that last verse 28 that people will look eagerly for his appearance the second time unto salvation. And I just wonder, do we look eagerly? Chan gets eager for Christmas. They'll count how many nights or how many sleeps, as they call it today, there are until Christmas. And they'll be working out, how many days do I have to wait until I get that present? Or they wait eagerly for the end of school and freedom. The holidays have come and they're excited about it and they can't wait for it. And you can put away the school bag and bring out the football and all the rest. There's an eager anticipation. And as I thought about that word eager, I just wonder, do we live with the eager anticipation of the coming again of the Lord Jesus? The question we have to ask ourselves, do we live with that eager anticipation? Is it something we're really looking forward to? It's more than just a doctrine in a book. It's a beautiful, fantastic hope that he, the one who formed this world, the one who died for our sin at Calvary, the one who's pleading for us in glory, is coming again. And we shall see him. Today we can just visualize, in a sense, with our minds as best we can. But on that day, we shall see him. That's the beautiful, blessed hope of the believer. There's a future appearing. Because in the past, he died for us. In the present, he's pleading for us. In the future, he's coming again for us. And that is our blessed hope. A world with all of its chaos and turmoil and sin and wrong will be no more. And wrongs will be righted. And everything will be changed. That's our hope. It's the hope of the believer. 
And that's the great divide. Because the believer has a blessed hope. The unbeliever will have a hopeless end. And that's the divide. That's the difference. And as it is appointed on the end once to die, and after this, the judgment. May we have that assurance in our hearts that we're ready for that appointment when it will come. And that we're really looking forward eagerly to that day when the heavens part and Jesus comes again. If you're a believer tonight, may you indeed have that eager anticipation. Don't hold on too tightly to the things of the world. Hold them lightly because there's something far better coming. And if you're not prepared, then make ready. Be prepared for that appointment that's coming. We're going to sing our closing hymn. And um, it's well-known one. There is coming a day. And what a day that will be. And when we get to the end of it, we'll have this, the chorus twice at the end. We'll work a wee bit harder there. We'll have the chorus twice at the end because it's such a great chorus for our closing hymn. presence with us and for thy help. We ask that thou wouldst write thy word upon our hearts and that we might be doers as well as hearers. For thy own people, Lord, inspire us and give us that eagerness to wait expectantly 
for that wonderful day of the Lord's return. And we pray, Lord, that any who are without Christ might remember there is an appointment that we cannot break and that they will endeavor, even tonight, to put their trust in the Savior. May grace and mercy and peace be the portion of thy people this night and forevermore. Amen.